welcome to a new episode of the brand called you today i have a very very interesting personality someone who spent a lot of time in the corporate world and is now devoting a lot of time um, giving back to society vivek gore welcome to the show thank you ashutosh uh, vivek is uh, a bcom uh, he's an mba from faculty of management studies he's been to the opm program at harvard he's worked for ge capital genpact aworks empire aviation he's board member in several companies and he is the founder of heart to heart foundation uh, vivek talk to us a little bit about your early career some of the things that you have done uh, before we move on to the second part of the interview so most of my career was with uh, general electric or ge capital as it was more popularly known in india mm -hmm. and then that company morphed into what is today called genpact uh and the other major part of my career was with my own business airworks india mm -hmm. uh prior to joining genpact and ge capital in 1996 mm -hmm. i was uh, i spent a few years with the tata group and with a small leasing company called first leasing company of india uh but those were the formative years so of my career so interesting you talk of first leasing because uh must have been the same time when i was with itc and i found it classic leasing okay so i i was well aware of classic Correct. leasing so it's a small world yes and i joined first leasing because in 85 leasing was a sunrise industry right. as you formed classic and itc wanted to get into it but sales tax laws changed and it made it very unattractive and first leasing was a pioneer in that business and i said this sounds like a good combination mm -hmm. and like all young mbas he was offering the highest salary out of uh, the mba school Correct. and you know we we all fall for that one uh, but i switched to tata's very shortly thereafter uh, in a company that was at that time called tata finance and it went through various iterations in later years and is part of tata capital mm -hmm. today mm -hmm. uh and uh, i was very keen to join general electric okay having read about jack welch and now i'm talking of the late 80s early 90s yeah. when he was an iconic personality i guess he still is he still is uh, though general electric isn't half the company today that it used to be 25 yeah, years back yeah. and i worked on ge for about 3 years to get a job mm. and i I got three different jobs in GE Capital. Mm -hmm. Uh and each time as soon as it was time for me to get the appointment letter their plans on India would change. Okay. So I think out of uh sort of exasperation they finally did give me a job as a treasurer uh working under Pramod Bhasin mm -hmm. uh and then I later became CFO of GE Capital okay. and uh, served in that role for 8 years. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, i think the most exciting part of that tenure was uh, working with promote to carve out ge capital international services Correct. from ge mm -hmm. uh, converting it into an independent company selling it to private equity mm -hmm. and then later taking it public on new york stock exchange listing it for over 3 billion dollars uh, that was a very very rich learning experience that must have been fascinating but i'm going to call you once some other time uh, to come and talk about the entire exercise if yes. you are permitted to do that uh yes why not uh, there there's a lot in the public domain which i could share okay uh it was certainly uh, it was the largest private equity transaction of its time correct now we are talking of 0304 yes and uh, it was promote's uh, vision uh, that jekis should be carved out made into genpack grown as a separate company uh, it was his way of contributing back to his country and uh, it took quite a while for the management at ge in the us to grasp this right and accept it uh, but uh, him as ceo and me as cfo kept hatching plans kept making presentations and we finally got our approvals from them Correct. after a while terrific terrific <clears throat> so you spent uh, how many years in the corporate sector uh 34 34 and or, or actually 33 okay. before i shifted to philanthropy okay and so my question is that after such a successful corporate career mm. um and you had 
quite a long runway ahead of you. Mm. Why did you decide to give up the corporate world and turn to philanthropy? So, uh, the desire to spend the sort of latter 20 years of my active life mm -hmm. uh, working with philanthropic organizations or creating my own philanthropic organizations was something that was on my mind from the time I was a teenager. Mm -hmm. So, Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Uh, in fact, the... You're clearly a very enlightened individual very early in life. <laughs> I, my <laughs> wife might have a different view on that, mm -hmm. but uh, this was definitely on my mind mm -hmm. in a very serious way. Mm -hmm. And uh, But, you know, we all have desire for uh, ambition, status, two ounces of publicity, mm -hmm. a little bit of money, and I was no different. So, I pursued a corporate career. Uh, I would not say I achieved everything I wanted or I achieved the pinnacle that I was aiming for. Mm -hmm. But at some point, I got to a stage where I said, the, the next, you know, tranche of money I earn, mm -hmm. it's sort of utility value from a spiritual, emotional, mental point of view is less, okay. getting less and less. So okay. maybe it is now time to switch gears. Mm -hmm. I actually thought I'd switch gears at 65, okay. you know, that would have been a more normal time. Uh, but various factors, the opportunity to move came in 2018 mm -hmm. and I decided to exit my business, which was Airworks India and switch gears full time mm -hmm. to philanthropy. Okay. Uh, it was not an easy decision. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess such decisions of moving from to the Vanas Prastha Ashram stage of life are never easy. Mm -hmm. uh, but at, I just said, That's this is as good a time. Let's go for it. That's fantastic. More power to you. <clears throat> so let, let's talk about, uh, you know, your Heart to Heart Foundation, um, which you uh, said yeah. you founded. Um, tell us a little bit about what you do in this foundation. Yeah. So first, let me tell you the problem the foundation addresses. Okay. Uh, India has one of the highest infant mortality and child mortality rates in the world. Correct. Uh, one for of multiple the main, reasons. For multiple reasons. Yes. One of the single largest causes is that the expectant mother is malnutrition during her pregnancy. Mm -hmm. And in most cases, even prior to that, as a young girl sure. or lady. Sure. And hence, the fetus is born with a defective heart. Oh, I see. So India has, you know, depending on government studies, we read about 300,000 children born with a defective heart each year. Mm -hmm. Roughly 100,000 die in the first year and a substantial number die in the first three years. Wow. Now, all this primarily due to malnutrition of the mother. And is there empirical data available which says that malnutrition could result in <clears throat> heart? There are some researches okay. on that. Okay. Uh, this is a disease of the poor. Mm -hmm. So it is not something that happens in common to say your grandchild or my grandchild tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Because we belong to a different uh, segment of society. Absolutely. Uh, and therefore, this has been researched very little. Okay. So cancer gets researched a lot because the disease that affects the rich True. also. True. Or I'm with you completely. heart surgery. It affects the I, rich. I'm completely on yeah. board with you because I served for eight years uh -huh. on the board of Gavi, which is the uh -huh. Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunization, uh -huh. which was set up for uh, to meet the fourth millennium development uh -huh. goal of the UN, uh -huh. which was for uh, uh, women and child health. Uh -huh. So I'm completely in agreement with you. Uh -huh. But coming back to your uh, yeah. your initiative, so we. Uh, Two friends of mine and I, mm -hmm. inspired by uh, a gentleman called C. Srinivas, and I'll come to him in a minute, mm -hmm. uh, set up this foundation with the express purpose of funding surgeries, mm -hmm. so pediatric heart surgeries, mm -hmm. for babies of poor families born with this heart defect. Correct. Now, heart defect can be of many kinds, hole in the heart, valve not working, valve fitted incorrectly. 
uh, whatever. I am not a doctor. Sure. Uh, but the cost of the surgery varies. In a missionary or a charitable, semi-charitable hospital, mm -hmm. the cost is between 85,000 to 4 lakhs. Mm -hmm. The average is between 1 lakh 50, give or take 10,000. Sure. So we said, let's set this up, raise money from high net worth individuals, corporate CSR, and try and see if we can fund a few individuals each month. Uh, at this point in time, we are supporting or sponsoring 30 to 40 children each month. Wow. Uh, and uh, we, uh, we have zoned in on a chain of hospitals called Sai Sanjeevni, mm -hmm. uh, which Srinivas set up. Mm -hmm. Srinivas is roughly your age. Okay. Uh, he is, in my opinion, a living version of Mother Teresa. Okay. Uh, very compassionate, very spiritual, uh, completely detached person, but obviously a great manager and brilliantly eff efficient because uh, these uh, three hospitals he has set up exclusively for pediatric work, uh, which specialize in these heart surgeries. Mm -hmm. They do about 300 to 400 a month. And they do it free of cost. Wow. You must introduce him to me to call him on the show. I <laughs> introduce him. He may not choose to come. But uh, I will definitely introduce okay. him. And uh, so we do all our surgeries at his three hospitals. Uh, why? One is we found quality very good. Mm -hmm. uh, quality as I could judge. But one of my uh, co-founders is a oncologist. So he can see it from a doctor's point of view. The other one is an entrepreneur making medical, inventing new medical gadgets. So he understands medicine. The second is compassion. Compassion for the patient. Right? If you go to a large hospital, any of these commercial hospitals, the poor patient who comes there gets treated like dirt. Mm. A, he's poor. He's lost. He's already terrified. He can't afford to pay. He gets tossed around from one place to the other. Mm -hmm. uh, patients are not treated with dignity and compassion. Mm -hmm. But here I found that the patients were being treated with so much dignity and compassion that I think some of them didn't want to go back. Wonderful. Uh, and so I said, okay, we're going to use the, them. Uh, we did a costing on what each type of surgery is, arrived at some broad parameters. And we've some, some, uh, uh, patients go directly there and they say, can you fund it? Some patients come to Heart to Heart Foundation and we direct them to the so hospital. So how do the patients, I mean, how does I say a young mother um, who is malnutrition um, first <coughs> realize that her child is in danger, unborn child, and once the child is born, how does she determine that there is a congenital heart issue and then reach, reach out to you? Very, very good question. And so we are going to now talk of the poorest one third of the Correct. country. Correct. There are two, three routes that happen. Uh, at the grassroots level, mm -hmm. through the ASHA workers or the Anganwadi workers, some minimum maternal postnatal checks do happen. Okay. Uh, if the heart problem is very serious, mm -hmm. it does get detected that there is some problem. Uh, many of these uh, poor people would also be visiting the government clinics and hospitals. Mm -hmm. uh, they would be visiting, you know, some local doctor because they start noticing that it's a blue baby or uh, the baby is not responding the way mm -hmm. a sure. one yeah. month or a two month old should. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, they don't catch it till the child is close to a year old. Mm -hmm. uh, and also the sort of poor in India, because the people in the 20th to 40th percentile are not as poor as when you and I were children. Mm. So some access to some private doctor, most of them have. Okay. Uh, however, after that, many of them get spun into a web mm -hmm. of expenditure. Uh, in these private clinics mm -hmm. or the government hospitals say we can't perform because we don't have the skill or capability. The uh, private doctors, some of them uh, take them on for a jolly ride. 
So we often find that they have completely exhausted all their economic resources in the treatment of that child uh, by the time they finally reached out to us. Uh, many of them are pretty much broke at that stage. Uh, so that's really how. And I guess there is a segment who never discover mm-hmm. or the baby died in three months in any case. That's, that's very unfortunate. Yeah. So, you know, since we are on, uh, on, on, on television and then uh, we're talking about all the good work you're doing, um, let's make a little pitch for Heart to Heart yeah. to all the people. And if someone wants to become a donor, how does it reach out? So you could go to our website, www.h2h.foundation. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a link on which you could make a payment. Okay. Uh, my phone number and email ID is there. Okay. Uh, you can always reach out to me in case you wish to give a check Wait. or a wire transfer yeah. instead of that typical credit card payment. Great. And we will be very happy to accept okay. your donation. Good. Thank you. So, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm sure this message will go Thank out to a so lot much. of people. Because you're doing such an amazing yeah. work. But let's move to the second part of your uh, work that you are doing. And you spoke, you spoke about uh, rural shores. Mm as an investor, mm. um, where you are again talking about skilling mm. and employment of rural youth. Mm. So once again, uh, here is Vivek Gaur who is giving back to children mm. and who is giving back to rural youth. Mm. Um, first question, tell us a little bit about uh, rural shores. And the next question is, mm. what is it that is driving you to keep doing so much? <laughs> I'm not sure I'm doing so much, but yeah, it does sound good. So see, heart to heart is about giving a person food to solve his hunger for the day. Correct. Rural shores is about teaching him how to fish. So uh, the credit for rural shores goes to a friend of mine, Murli Vulaganti, currently based in the US, but he spends time equally between India and US. Mm -hmm who came up with this concept about 15 years back that mini BPO centers should be set up in the villages. Very small centers, 50 employee, 100 employee centers doing work in regional (coughs) languages like call center work in regional languages for the big companies in the big cities. And uh, those youth should be from that village and neighboring villages so that they get employment in their Uh, locality. They are not forced to migrate to large cities and live in slums or, you know, they go through all kinds of stresses. And these BPOs, uh, are they part of some large organizations or are they standalone BPOs? No, these are call centers. So these call centers are all rural shores call centers. Okay. Rural shores is the BPO. I see. Okay. And uh, we recruit people, we train them, we employ them. Mm -hmm. And most stay with us for two, three years Mm -hmm. because in that village, now by village, I mean village. I'm not saying tire for town. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, the, you know, it would be a village where the only way to reach is by catching a state road transport bus and go jostling down for two hours. But the infrastructure that rural shows requires is Uh, available. Now it is available. Okay. 15 years ago, it was not. So you'll be surprised to learn that roughly half of India's villages have fiber connectivity today. Uh, So that then enables a call center to get set up. Uh, The youth in the villages, I find, are there's no shortage of intelligence. Mm -hmm. There's no shortage of cunning either. Mm -hmm. Uh, So, you know, both sides. It's not as if they're holy cows or Mm -hmm. something. Mm -hmm. But they're all enthusiastic to learn. For them, it's a great opportunity because the call center would typically be a pakka brick uh, building. Mm -hmm. Uh, It may or may not be air conditioned, but it will definitely be clean. There's a canteen, there's a proper toilet, there's a table tennis room, etc. And for that 21 year old villager, Mm -hmm. this is like, this is a great job to have. So, you know, Vivek, uh, you know, you've been a corporate professional, Mm -hmm. you've been an entrepreneur, Mm -hmm. you've been associated with uh, heart to heart, you've been associated with rural shores. Um, Let me 
try and get some yarn from you for all our listeners. You know, a lot of them are startup entrepreneurs. <clears throat> Based on all the experience, what are some of the basic mistakes mm. a startup entrepreneur makes? Startup entrepreneur. Uh, a startup entrepreneur, and I have been a startup entrepreneur too. Uh, not Airworks was uh, attempt two. I had okay. one earlier attempt which failed spectacularly. Okay. Is that every entrepreneur is convinced he or she has built the perfect mousetrap. Correct. And the world is just dying to buy my mousetrap. Correct. As a consequence, we block out signals from the environment which tell us uh, that a the world is not willing to buy a mousetrap or the world needs a fly swatter and not a mousetrap or this mousetrap is too expensive or whatever. So the willingness to be open and say, hey, this idea is not going to work. I need to switch gears. Mm -hmm. uh, number one, most entrepreneurs uh, in today's environment uh, miss out on that. And I'm talking of people who often are first generation entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. So unlike the traditional business communities of India, the, you know, uh, highly capable Guptas, Agarwals, Bansals, where the entire family was in business for seven generations. So there's tribal knowledge to help you. Right? But a lot of startups today are first generation, first time entrepreneurs. Uh, their father worked in a government job. Their mother was a school teacher. They don't have the benefit of this tribal background. Mm -hmm. The second is that the challenges that lie ahead of you are usually about five or ten times greater than anything you think mm. is the case. Anything you think is the case. Yeah, I'm with you. Yeah, the Go third ahead. is uh, sometimes in some areas like e-commerce or IT or a few buzzword uh, industries, uh, we have too much capital chasing too few good deals. So it's possible to raise some initial capital without realizing that in the hubris and excitement that you've raised the capital, mm -hmm. you have to find a way to one day give it back. Mm -hmm. So I worry about entrepreneurs that are always on a burn, uh, not generating cash, not generating profit. Correct. And, uh, you know, one day the cows are going to come home and say, give my money back. Yeah. I'm and, with you completely uh, agree. So <coughs> a follow-up question uh, on that. Um, and this I'm asking you because of all the experience you have. Mm. You know, the Indian mindset mm. after my parents mm. uh, and now I as a parent, mm. we basically have been telling our kids and we were told that you have to win. Mm. Which, you know, manifests itself in all of us trying to be right in front of the traffic light and mm. in every queue, we must be fast. Yes. You know, and it's, it's a mindset because of yeah. our population. Nowhere are we taught mm. the importance of understanding failure. Mm. And I'm do, you know, trying to do a lot of research with a mm. lot of people like you to mm. say how important is it mm. for our young people to understand that failure is not doomsday. Yes. What are your thoughts? So uh, in my life personally, uh, failure has been the best teacher. Very painful, very hurtful, very depressing. Mm -hmm. But in the long run, it is always the best teacher. Yeah. yeah. And you're right that our culture that we must always win, beta tumko first ana hi hai, sort of a thing, uh, then pushes us to believe that happiness will only come from success. Mm -hmm. So in 2000, with a few friends, I set up a dot-com startup, mm. the first generation dot-com startup. So did I and lost a lot of money. Lost a lot of money, yeah. got completely broke. And uh, I left my job with General Electric mm. to do this. Mm. Uh, my wife didn't know any better. So she said, yeah, maybe it will work out. And I was so exuberant. Mm. Again, the perfect mousetrap. Right. Uh, I didn't even realize that one of the partners was making a complete mickey of the rest mm -hmm. uh, of us. And uh, we, we completely exploded. Mm -hmm. We didn't realize that we had come to the party too late mm -hmm. by 
January 2000, the party was winding down just when we were getting in. Correct. So, uh, I lost a lot of money. Mm. Uh, the company folded up. I didn't have a job. Uh, two children, mm. a EMI on our house to pay to HDFC. So, my mother said, you better go back to GE and fall at their feet and get a job. Correct. Which is exactly what I did then. Wonderful. And GE was gracious enough to hire me back. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so, so also failures in uh, uh, you know my tenure at Airworks. Everything didn't go perfect. Mm. Uh, these all help you learn, Great. provided you're willing to sit back, be humble, introspect, and say, "Okay, stuff happened, mm. uh, but you know." Uh, I can start today and change the rest of my life. I agree. Well said. Very well said. So, a few questions uh, for you personally now. Definitely. Um, you know, um, tell me what would you, you know, you had an amazing career and you're doing amazing work now. What would be the three adjectives mm -hmm. that would dis uh, define your strengths? And I know one you did mention perseverance because of the way you kept for three years after G, but I'm sure there are many others. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yes, perseverance uh, would be one or doggedness. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the uh, my greatest strength is detachment. Okay. Uh, so, our wives know us best. Mm -hmm. So, this morning I asked her, this question is going to come, what should I say? Mm -hmm. And she came up with detachment. Okay. Uh, ups and downs come. Uh, tragedies happen in life. Mm. Uh, sometimes great success also comes, which can go up here and make you a little lightheaded. Okay. Uh, but I think what has served me well all through is detachment. Take care. This will also move on. This fantastic. Ah, got a double promotion. Very good. Mm. No big deal. You haven't become chairman of Unilever. Mm. So, relax and enjoy it. Mm. Similarly, failure has happened, like happened in my first dot com, which was completely devastating. But one week later, I got a job in GE. So, at least the monthly bills could be paid. Mm. So, uh, detachment from uh, helps me stand aside and say, okay, so what happened? And not feel too much anger, resentment, uh, nurturing, disappointment, or anything of the kind. That's, that's you know, very well. Take care. Let, let's keep. Detachment doesn't mean laziness or I mean, lack of interest. Yeah. Yeah. Also, it, probably a, not looking back and yeah, you know, regretting. Why not regretting too much? Yeah. We all are human. There's always some look back. But as I said, my favorite phase is you can start from today and change the rest of your life. Terrific. So, Vivek, this gives me an interesting segue into my next question. Mm. You know, we've been speaking of failures and mm. learning. Mm. Um, and we've all had our fair share of learnings. And mm. a lot of people who view our discussions mm. are young people who somehow feel that successful people like you have not had failures. Mm. And uh, that's why I ask this question from all my guests. Mm. What have been some of your learnings from your failures? Uh, one is uh, not to underestimate myself. Okay. Mm -hmm. And all of us are capable of applying our minds, uh, common sense, mm -hmm. and a huge amount of effort Correct. to overcome a situation. And the situation could be a business situation. It could be issues with colleagues or bosses or customers. It could be legal problems that have fallen on you. Uh, it could be anything. It could be a, you know, near fatal illness of a child. Mm. It can be many things. But don't underestimate yourself. Okay. Second is, don't underestimate the challenge. Mm. Uh, I often come across people, I'm not saying it's an issue of young people today, it was an issue of young people 50 years ago also, mm. who say, Main ye kar mm. no problem, I'll just crack the exam. I say, oh man, I mean, either you're Einstein or you've underestimated the situation. Mm -hmm. So they sort of walk in or, or they need to bluff themselves that this is easy. Mm -hmm. And maybe one year later, they wonder what happened and don't introspect enough 
And I find this happening with, uh, I often find this happening with uh, people who are younger in age. Maybe it happens with older people too. But underestimating the challenge that lies ahead and what resources you will have to put to overcome them. Uh, we get too caught up with our Correct. own dream sequence of what that means Correct. rather than what lies under the lake over there. Very true. Very well said. So I only have two more questions here yeah. for you. Um, next question is, do you have any regrets? So one regret I have is, uh, you know, my, my, I have failed to be able to reduce my weight mm -hmm. despite spending 25 years trying. Okay. I think there is no diet in this world I have not attempted mm -hmm. or no combination of diet, exercise, pill standing on your head that I have not tried. Mm -hmm. uh, and I do realize that to be able to be effective and active and healthy for the next 20 years from 57 to 77, I need to find a way to reduce my weight. Okay, and I'm sure and, you'll uh, <laughs> I'm sure that, you'll. that has beaten me completely. Wonderful. And my last question to you now is, a uh, lot of young people starting out like you and I did, mm. you know, I'm older than you, mm. uh, many, many years ago. Mm. All starry-eyed, corporate mm. careers, mm. entrepreneurs. Mm. As you look back at life, mm. What are some of your learnings that you want to share with them? So one is uh, we have too much of the media. It was there in our time and it is infinitely more today telling us what we need to be to be happy. And the I would call it a disease, the disease of social media and the dopamine hits of those likes mm. are deciding a lot for our young people. Mm. And our young people are very intelligent, very capable. Uh, they are growing into an India which is becoming an economic powerhouse. So they have all the best opportunities that were not there 50 years ago. And they are getting trapped in what means happiness, what means success, mm -hmm. what should I be doing or not doing or wearing, you know, so people sort of constantly clicking their photos and placing it on Facebook or wherever mm -hmm. is an indication of a desperation for reassurance all the time. And if you have to be successful in life, either materially or spiritually, Facebook and Instagram cannot be your measure of who you are. Very well said. And you cannot... I, I, I worry that a lot of young people start believing their own newspaper stories Correct. Uh, Correct. that they put up on Facebook. You get carried away by your own hype. You get carried away by your own hype. And it's taking away so much energy which you could otherwise have put into your career or skill development or improving your relationship with your spouse and parents. Uh, that would be, this is a new phenomena that was not there 20 years ago. Right. So Vivek, uh, thank you very much. I think Pleasure. incredible words of wisdom. Thank you so much. And good luck to everything that you are doing. Yes. And more power. Thank you so much. Thank you again. Thank you for listening to the Brand Called You podcast. Be sure to visit tbcy.in to join the conversation, access show notes and discover fantastic bonus content. You can follow us on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. Simply search for The Brand Called You. Thank you and see you next week.